Well, let me introduce our, our speaker for tonight, Tom Young. Um, he's a, a flight instructor in A&P with Inspection Authority, works up at uh, Royal Aircraft uh, in Hagerstown, um, and um, regale us with some, some stories about maintenance. So, thank you, Tom. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Tom Young, and I learned to fly in 1968, served an apprenticeship for my mechanics license, and been flying and working on little airplanes ever since. A um, couple of things I wanted to bring up first is, um, I picked out topics that are in the mainstream of pilot talk kind of thing, and so I thought I'd explain a little bit about that. Most of the things that I want to talk about will be pertaining to Lycoming or Continental engines with magnetos on them. Uh, electronic ignition is still new to me, and sometimes I've been involved in it, and sometimes I haven't. And I'm, I'm the kind of person that can talk coherently about magneto issues. Um, I was asked to keep my talk to 30 to 40 minutes, <laughs> so I will try to do that. And please wait until I'm done before you start asking questions, because a lot of people start asking questions, and then we'll get sidetracked, and then the time drags on. So, um, first thing I'm going to start with is spark plug fouling and leaning engines <coughs> stand up. Um, these two spark plugs are out of a uh, lengthening engine that I recently did an annual inspection on. And this spark plug here is the top one. And notice how the nose of the spark plug around in here and the electrode are kind of clean. However, there is a lot of buildup and it's pretty nasty in here. So I have a closer up picture of the top spark plug. And the reason I referred them to the top and the bottom uh, will be evident in the picture that will come up here in a short time. But this is kind of normal operation. There is a little bit of buildup on the nose here just because the lead melts into the uh, hot nose cone of the spark plug. And this is the one that has all of the lead deposits built up in it around here and down in here and on the electrode here. So, this is the bottom part. <clears throat> um, this is a cutaway of a Lycoming cylinder head. And over here we have the piston in here. And over here we have the combustion chamber. And here we have the upper spark plug. And then here's the lower spark plug. Now, <clears throat> when the engine is running, Especially at lower RPMs, the lead and the tetraethyl lead and the uh, gasoline, being heavier than the fuel and the air in there, will settle down into this lower spark plug here. <clears throat> Back when they had 80 octane gas, the lead content was so low and the compression of the uh, little engine, 65, 75, 85 horsepower, 0200, was low enough that. Um, they would run on the 80 octane fuel just fine. <clears throat> However, back in the um, mid to late 70s, when the little airplanes that people were learning flying, like Cubs and Champs and Muskins and Taylor Crafts and things like that, um, <clears throat> were starting to uh, grow into the 152s and 172s and things like that had a higher compression engines. So the 80 octane gas started going away. Well, at that point, there was only 80 and 100 octane gasoline. So they wanted to try to find out some way to uh, keep the uh, <clears throat> uh, little engines running without too much fouling. And they found out that, that if they reduced the amount of tetraethyl lead in the 100 octane gasoline, that 100 oct uh, high compression engines would operate normally on half the lead, and it would reduce the amount of buildups in the lower spark plug, and so that's why you now have 100 low lead. It's because it's more than the 80 octane, but less than the 100 that was out there before. 
So you're sitting at idle and the lead is building up down in here, the vapors and so forth here. And a lot of research was done on how to uh, reduce the amount of lead buildup in the lower spark plug. They found out that <clears throat> the reason that the lead come, becomes uh, chunky and melt down into the spark plugs is because there's when you advance the throttle from idle to takeoff power, you'll uh, all of a sudden create a lot of heat in the combustion chamber. And what it does is it actually reaches the melting point of the lead, and the lead will melt itself right down in here into the spark plug. And it'll keep on building up, building up, building up until it'll actually short out the electrodes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that they tried to do was make uh, spark plugs that had an extended electrode. The electrode came out much farther, out about this far. And so the lead would build up around in here, but it wouldn't actually short out the electrodes across there. The problem really arose with flight school airplanes, a lot of training, a lot of low RPM stuff, a lot of jamming the throttle and things like that. So um, it was just, they designed that uh, special extended electrode spark plug to handle those kinds of things. A little bit more research was done, and they found out that one of the reasons why the lead got deposited down in here is because there wasn't anything happening to scavenge the heavy lead out of the bottom of the spark plug. Out of the bottom of the spark plug. So but some research was done, and they found out that if you brought the RPM up to about 13 to 1500 RPM for 5 to 10 seconds before you went above 1500 RPM, then there was enough turbulence from the piston going back up and down in here that it would actually scavenge or blow out the lead that was lying down here in the bottom of the spark plug. Then you could go up to the high heat range at takeoff power, and there was no lead left down in here to precipitate out into the deposits that you see. I've told a lot of people about this, and this is the kind of things that get spread around that uh, most pilots don't hear about, and they have a hard time understanding about holding the throttle at 1400 RPM for five seconds before they continue up with the power. Most people that I've talked to, that I've explained this to, they'll come back to me a little bit later and say, you know, I can't get out of the habit of going from 1,000 RPM up to takeoff power. Well, one of the reasons they went to the 1,000 RPM idle is because the 1,000 RPM will create a little bit more turbulence in the combustion chamber. But it doesn't completely eliminate the issue because the lead is heavy and it settles down into the lower spark plug. So the 1,000 RPM thing was kind of a trade-off. Now, a lot of people say, well, I lean my engine out when I'm taxiing around on the ground. However, that does not take care of the problem because the problem arises from the lead uh, uh, down in the lower spark plug. So the cure for that is to hold the RPM at 1400 RPM for five seconds before you go above 1500 RPM. Because they found that the 16 to 1800 RPM range was where the heat started getting so great that it was melting the lead in the low spark plugs. This is my issue stainless steel screws. This is what new stainless steel screws look like. You know, they have nice sharp corners in here for the Phillips slot, and they have nice sharp threads here, like that. And then, this is a countersunk screw. Note how nice and clean and sharp the edges around here are, and how nice the threads are here. So, that being said, <coughs> Raise your hand if you know what this is. <laughs> Raise your hand if I say this is named after a bar drink called made with 
vodka and orange juice and milk. <laughs> Phillips screwdriver. It's got a nice sharp tip on it. I've got some pictures. How many of you had one of these? What's it called? It's called water driver. Technical term? Speed or speed. How many of you have one of these? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just keep your hand up, Steve. I have a drill, not a screw gun. <laughs> okay? If you have one of these, you will soon have screws that look like this. <laughs> now, this is a screwdriver tip. This the these pictures are kind of fuzzy. I took them with a bore scope because I wanted to get them real close. But if you notice the screwdriver tip here, it's nice and sharp and clean around in here to fit into the slot on the screw. However, this is a worn out one. Notice how it's all worn out and narrowed here. So if you try using this screwdriver on one of the screws, you'll eventually wind up with screws that look like this. Okay. And most of the time, this happens from people that are using screw guns. Um, how many of you will be putting a screw in with a screw gun, and all of a sudden the screw binds up, and so you crank the clutch up and try driving it a little bit more, and it gets even tighter? Or you take the screw out, and it's so high you can't touch it? The problem is, <clears throat> these screws are stainless steel. This is what the threads will look like. See how this screw, how the threads are all dinged up here? And down in here. This thread right here should be as nice and sharp as clean as this one. This one has been used in what's called the tournament knife. And it's a stainless steel clip-on fastener that's made to the same pitch as the dimension between the threads here. <coughs> and they also make nut plates for machine threads in here. The nut plates and the tinnermans are stainless steel. And there is a process whereby when two pieces of the same metal <coughs> are pressed together under high pressure, they have a tendency to do what's called galling and become one piece of metal. And so when you try driving this screw in and it gets tight, it's tearing up the threads. And so you'll not only damage the threads on the screw, anytime you see a screw that comes out with damaged threads there, the nut plate is going to damage too. And nine times out of ten, they put nut plates in, in Places where you can't get at them to replace them. So the problem arises where if you do get a stripped out nut plate, what do you do? <laughs> so here are two broken tenement uh, nuts. See? There should be a tab like this over on this side. And this kind of thing arises from using screw guns. Because you push on the screw, and you pull the trigger, and you push on that screw, you pull that screw up, and you wind up bending the tab until it breaks off. Or, or you drive the screw in with your screw gun, and you pull it in so tight it breaks it off. You have no feel for what the, th what the screw and the fastener are actually doing together. So the problem is getting stainless screws out. I had Tom uh, <clears throat> help me a, a little project on the 150 here. I brought my left-handed drill bits down here, thinking I could pull the screws out with a left-handed drill bit, because I found that if I use an electric drill and turn it real slow and push real hard, sometimes a left-handed bit will grab the screw and pull it out. Well, I had, what, three left in there that you had to come down and yeah. take out for me? Because he had carbide bits. I'd never heard of carbide bits before. He said, they're tougher than the cobalt ones that I brought down. So he saved me, saved my bacon on that one. 
So uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, if you use it, the thing about the skew gun is when you pull the trigger, you can't feel when the bit is going to cam up out of the slot. And by the time it does, it skips around two or three times and it pairs up the <coughs> in the head. So with a, a speed handle or a regular handled screwdriver, every time you release your grip on it, you can reseat the screwdriver bit down into the screw and so you're less prone to remove uh, <coughs> slots on the screw. When I get into tough screws with my speed handle, I'll actually go like this around with the speed handle so that I make sure that the bit reseats itself down into the screw. I deal with this all the time. That uh, airplane that had the fouled spark plug on the bottom, it was a Beechcraft Bonanza. It has four inspection panels on the top of the wing. Each one has about 20 screws in it. And because I was doing this talk tonight, I counted them. There were 27 screws that looked like that <laughs> out of the four panels. It's like, well, I'm going to have to replace the screws. Luckily, they all came out. Now, what's the cure for that? Well, plain CAD plated steel screws are not stainless. And so there's no galling that occurs between the nut plate or the tinnerman and the screw. And back when I was learning to work on airplanes, about the only time I had to use some harsh means of getting a screw out was when they were rusted in because they'd been in so long. So when I put an airplane back together doing an inspection, generally the tinnerman, uh, the sheet metal screws come out pretty easy and on all the nut plates uh, with the machine screws in it, I'll take my oil can and I'll put a little drop of oil. I'll go to every one of those four inspection panels on that beach craft. When I got ready to put the panels on, I took my oil can and I went doo -doo 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 -doo, and I put one drop of oil in each one of the screw holes in each one of the nut plates. And the screws went right in, no problem. You can also do that with the stainless screws. It helps the problem, but doesn't take care of it. So, <clears throat> that's just one of the things that I run into day to day to day to day to day. Um, something else about lubricating fasteners when you put them in is, um, I was taught, I served an apprenticeship for my mechanics license. And when I was learning to work on airplanes, I was taught that if I'm going to put a bolt in, if I have to take it out in 20 years, will I be able to take it out? So I was taught to put a little bit of wheel bearing grease on like spar bolts and strut bolts and landing gear bolts and any kind of thing that wouldn't be there for, uh, that would be there for a long time but might not come out. And just as an example, I brought some show and tell stuff down from the Taylor Craft that I'm restoring. It's a 1939 Taylor Craft. And one of the things over there is a brake and wheel assembly and I took that brake assembly off an airplane that I rebuilt back in the early 70s and I had put the brake in with countersunk screws and I put grease on each one of the screws because I had no idea how long it was going to take <coughs> before the screws would ever come out. I happened to get the, the remains of my old fuse slides that had those brake assemblies on it and by golly I took those screws out just the same way I put them in and there was still grease left on them after 50 years because I put those wheels together <laughs> in 1973. Uh, so it does pay off. Alright, now, leaning. Leaning the mixture in the engine. Okay. There's a whole bunch of stuff going around now about lean and peak operations, okay? <coughs> and that's fine. This guy had been running his engine lean and peak. And this is the exhaust valve in one of the cylinders. And this is kind of a normal looking valve that's been run, this area right in here. However, this red circle in here 
shows that the valve has been running overheated. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> back when I was back in the 60s and 70s, we never had issues like this because the way we were taught to lean the engines out was you pull the mixture out until the engine starts running a little rough and then push it back in at quarter or three-eighths of an inch. And we never had issues like this. So, along in the 80s when gas prices started going up, and especially the 90s, then engine monitor systems came out. And now people wanted to squeak every last bit of fuel they could to make their engine run. They wanted to save money. When I was serving my apprenticeship, the guy that I served at under said, two of the cheapest things that you can put in your engine are fuel and oil. <laughs> so, uh, then the Lena Peak operators came out, and then you have to have the JPI system and gam ejectors and all this other advertising gimmickry. And um, then people started having problems like this. I used to uh, do the work on a, AOPA had an 836 Bonanza years ago. And they, I worked on it. They bring it in every 50 hours for an oil change and every year for an annual inspection. They flew it 300 hours a year. And the airframe was fine, but they wanted the oil change regularly and that kind of stuff. So after doing that for three years, they wanted a JPI system installed in it. Every 100 hour inspection on that engine, they had valves that looked like this or maybe even this. Because the guys were leaning the engine out, they were making the exhaust so hot that the valves could not withstand the heat. This valve down here, over in this section here, it's a badly burned valve. This cylinder only had 36 PSI compression on it when we did the compression check on it, which is why I bore scope the engine, because we wanted to look and see what was going on. And that was it, right there. That valve is so badly burned. And not only that, if you look around here, you see these radial streaks coming out of here like this. That shows where the exhaust gases had been blowing through the gaps between the valve seat and uh, the valve face and the valve seat here. Back what kinds of exhaust gas temperatures will cause that? Mm -hmm. What kind of exhaust gas temperatures will cause that? 1550 and above. Now, if you look at I, I had a lot of fun doing this. I was great at coloring in Because <laughs> I could really stay between the lines, you know? And I did this because I, I, it was too confusing. You see all this kind of stuff and you can't really differentiate what's going on there. However, here's our exhaust valve right here. Actually, this is an intake valve, but let's pretend it's an exhaust valve. So, the valve gets really hot on the front here and the lip of the valve, the, this area right here, it's called the lip of the valve where it touches the seat. This is the valve seat, this purple right here. So when that valve closes, the valve face is actually transferring heat to the seat and thence out to the aluminum fins and then out to the air. Also, the heat travels down here and into the guide, this is the valve guide, <clears throat> and it transfers the heat over here into the cylinder and then up through the fins and out. So, if you have any kind of leakage in here, then you're going to increase the temperature of the lip of the valve right in here, which is what causes the burning. Which is why you get these little radial lines here as the exhaust gas is going between the seat and the face of the valve. <clears throat> so, one of the things that uh, occurs with people that want to do lean of peak operations is they're used to running the engines on the rich side of peak. So, if they're um, 
EGT is running at, let's say, 1,430 degrees, most people would run at 1,330 or 1,380. The recommendation is 50 to 100 degrees on the rich side of peak because what happens is the excess fuel is used to cool the valve right in here. So the Lena Peak guys say, well, if I put more air in the cylinder, then the air will keep the valve cool, plus which it won't run as hot because you don't have as much fuel in there. <clears throat> the big thing that a lot of people that go to Rich, uh, Lena Peak don't understand is you cannot dilly-dally between 100 degrees on the rich side of peak and 100 degrees on the lean side of peak. If you take your time, five minutes, you'll burn a valve like that. So they call it the big pull. So you look at your fuel flow, and if you want to go lean a peak, you make this very positive movement of the mixture control back until you get on the uh, lean side of peak. A lot of guys think that because they're running on the lean side of peak, they can run at a higher EGT. <laughs> so what they're doing is they're, they need to apply more air in here to be able to cool the valve, but they'll, they're only going to 30 degrees on the lean side of peak, so they're still running the valve at a really, really high temperature. They're not going lean enough to make it worthwhile to save the valves. So running lean to peak, uh, there's not as much combustion pressure and less wear on the connecting rod bearings and the pistons and stuff like that. So I, I, I'm explaining to you the things that I have found over the years that are issues that pilots don't understand yet. So anyway, I thought I'd bring that up. And lastly, <clears throat> How many people grease their wheel bearings once a year? How many people change your oil regularly? When was the last time you oiled your rudder hinges? <laughs> how, many, how many people have RVs here? Your flaps are held on with piano hinges like this. Now, this is off a of Cessna 172 that we have in the shop here right now. You see all this black stuff right around in here between these hinge segments? This is called a piano hinge. It's got, it's got fingers like that on it and a wire between it, and it goes like this back and forth. And so the aileron goes up and down. However, there's a stainless steel hinge pin in there, and these two segments of this aluminum hinge piece attached to the aileron and this aluminum hinge piece attached to the wing, they're just rubbing themselves together. Here's another picture of the same aileron farther out. See the black streaks here? That's the aluminum wearing itself out. So, when I do inspections on an airplane, I take my oil can and I put a drop of oil there, and a drop of oil there, and a more drop of oil there, and a more drop of oil there, and more drop of oil there. On the Beechcraft Bonanza, there are 57 segments of piano hinge, and I put a drop of oil on each one. How many people have one of these <coughs> in their earplugs? <coughs> it's called a Bowden cable. B O W D E N. Or a lot of people call it. A lawnmower throttle cable. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah, pass that around. That is a stainless steel spring, a wound wire with a stainless steel wire inside of it. How do you need to take that? Or do you need to? Well, it works just fine, but I take my oil can when I'm doing an inspection in the airplane that has them, heater cables, parking brake cables, you know, mixture control cables, 
all that kind of stuff that are that specific kind of cable. And I just run oil down the entire length of it, whatever I can reach. And after three days, that oil will work its way in and make that thing move. A lot of those lines. Huh? A lot of those have plastic. That's the, yeah, I was going to get to that point. A lot of them, a lot of um, cables are have a Teflon lining to them. And they generally have a plastic coating on the outside of it, so you can't do anything with it. So... But any of them that are that small <coughs> and have a wire inside of it, just run some oil down it. Yeah. Or where your rudder cable is attached to the rudder horn. You know, you got bolts go down in there, and they rub back and forth on the bell crank, and they wear themselves out. So you should put a little drop of oil on it. it doesn't, anything that moves, twists, turns, slides, etc., etc., put some oil on it. Um, when I was work, learning to work on airplanes, we just used engine oil. So I have a squirt can and I just have engine oil. There are no type certificated aircraft manufacturers that call for LPS or WD-40 or any of that kind of stuff. They all call for a light machine oil. Those kinds of products are not lubricating oils. Even though it says it lubricates, but it's not the kind of lubrication that these, whoops, <laughs> how'd that happen? <coughs> it's not the kind of lubrication that these things require. And we have, we buy that light kind of that oil that they call for is a light machine oil. It's like three in one oil. And we have found that using that it tends to wash out of the gaps, you know, if you get in the rain or something like that. However, 50 weight and 40, 40 or 50 weight engine oil will really hang in there and keep those things moving really easy. Um, years ago, we had, uh, I served my apprenticeship down at Davis Airport, down at Davisburg. There was a guy that came in from uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and he had a Cessna 170. And he had been flying, he moved the airplane there, moved into the area. And so about five months after he moved in, he wanted us to do the annual inspection on the 170. So I went over, untied the airplane, got it. <coughs> this with the elevators, I mean, they were, if I pull it, I, they, they would stay wherever I put them. And the ailerons were really tough to move, and the flaps were tough to move, and stuff like that. So. During the course of the inspection, I got in there and I lubricated all that stuff, and we kept working it back and forth to get everything nice and free. And then when we got done, you could pull the elevator back, pull the control yoke back, and the elevators would go down of their own accord. The yoke would just go forward. So, we got done the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> we, we finished the airplane and Ted came out the following week and we were sitting in the office there and you know, Ted came in and said, well, I had the inspection go fine. We didn't find anything wrong with it, just the controls were stiff and things like that. So he went out and got in the airplane and taxied it over, did his run up. He charged off down the runway and all of a sudden we heard the power come back <laughs> in about a minute later, here comes Ted taxiing back up in front of the office and shut the engine down. He came into the office and said, man, I got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, you guys have left something loose in my airplane. Said, what do you mean left it loose? He said, the elevators don't stay where I put them anymore. It's like, well, they're the way they're supposed to be, Ted. We just lubricated all that stuff up. So it doesn't take long to do that kind of stuff, but it helps the longevity of all these kinds of things. So Now, any questions? <clears throat> I've done my presentation. How about magnesium hinges like the 190s used to have and the rubber baiters? Okay. Are these two metals the same? Aluminum and alumina yeah. are the ones, are magnesium ones the same? Yeah. Okay. Then you're going to have wear. Everything, anything that moves like this should be lubricated in some way, shape, or form. Now, you guys with the RVs, the only way to lubricate your flap 
hinges correctly is disconnect the push-pull tube and let the air flap all the way down so you can get at it from the top. It's the only way to do it. You can't do it from the bottom. And a lot of guys like to use LPS and those kinds of products because it's in a nice handy little spray can. And you just go, Psh, if you even dare do that. But a lot of guys don't even do that. Yeah. I mean, this one, maybe we haven't talked about this, but you lubricate with different weight lubricants. Sometimes the good deed goes punished because it seems to attract dirt. Yes. So, what can, how can you speak to that? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of afraid to lubricate things on the outside of the airplane. If it's dry and it's working well, do I really want it, something that's sticky? It's only going to attract dirt external to the hinge. I mean, if, if I put a drop of oil here, the guy flies an airplane, you'll see oil streaking back. So what I do is, when I put a drop of oil on there, and oil works at a molecular level. You know that? You, you don't need to put 10 drops of oil there because oil is going to do capillary action and get inside of there. The dirt can't get inside of there. It's a good point. But my experience has been you're better off maybe with something like that than wearing out your hinges and have to replace your hinges. Well, you know I do overdo things every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? How do you handle the run-up of a constant speed prop? What do you mean? Going to 1300. So you're just going to push forward in 13? Five seconds, go to 18 or 2,000. Anytime you're going to go above 1,500, whether it's for a run-up or taxi or whatever, then you want to stop at 13, 1,400 RPM for five seconds and then go on up. And you can taxi around all day long at idle at 650 RPM, or wherever your idle is set for, taxi around all day long. As long as you stop at 1400 RPM for five seconds, you won't have the lead fouling issues. And Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, it's just that it's the turbulence in the cylinder heat that gets rid of all the gas, uh, all the lead in the lower spark plugs. Yeah, which I do. However, no. Thankfully, the Lycoming engine that I'm going to put in my Taylor car, those spark plugs are on the top. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about that. All right. One more little thing. I have some show and tell things over there from uh, my Taylor Crank project. So I've got, got to my time limit. So if anybody wants to look at that kind of stuff during the break, I'll be happy to show you what I've been doing. Any other questions? That's it. Okay. Who can name that airplane? Feel your Nobody? Molly? No. H295 Helio Curry. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. You win. <laughs> <laughs>